My name is Stacy Krim and today is Monday, June 4th, 2018. I am speaking with Dr. Thomas K. Fitzgerald, Professor Emeritus of the Department of Anthropology with his partner, ceramic artist, Bill Johnston. This oral history interview is for the UNCG Institutional Memory Collection. Thank you for participating in this project and sharing your experiences with us. So, to get you started, you're a North Carolina native, right? Yes, Lexington, North Carolina. Wow. So, uh, you originally started your academic career at UNC Chapel Hill? I did, and there to Paris, and after that to Stanford University, and then back for a PhD at Chapel Hill. Did you know you were going to focus on anthropology from the beginning? Pretty much. Uh, the first undergraduate experience I had was a course I took in anthropology and the professor was pretty awful, but I loved the content uh, and I realized right away that although I had gone to Chapel Hill to study Latin and Greek, I uh, decided right then. So all my entire life I have devoted to anthropology in a way. Mm -hmm. And what was your primary focus in anthropology? Well, it started as cultural anthropology, and then it really shifted to psychological, kind of Margaret Median mm -hmm. psychological anthropology. And I even did an undergraduate study on homosexuality as a, a kind of honors thesis. Mm -hmm. And that was well received. The librarians told me that it was the most read thesis they had on file. Wow. What was the primary focus of that work? Well, it was basically my getting into the idea that uh, anthropology had some insight into the human condition, including sexual minorities. Mm -hmm. So I began to look at what I could find in anthropology that would give me that kind of insight. Did you find anthropology to be one of the better disciplines for studying LGBT I think it's identities? always been very uh, open-minded and accepting diversity, and that's what mm -hmm. we're all about. Mm -hmm. So uh, we expect people to have different religions and different belief systems and different ways of behaving. Mm -hmm. so. And you published on homosexuality pretty early on, The Heterosexual Illusion, in 1964. Do you remember that publication? The Heterosexual Illusion? I can't remember that particular one, but uh, I, I, would, I began my publication career early, even when I was in Paris um, as a student at the Sorbonne. I uh, quickly found the gay groups there and, and they published a couple of things. Mm -hmm. right, so. so I think that was, gave me both an international perspective and then of course anthropology took me to different parts of the world and I was, I'm grateful for that. So, so you found gay groups at the Sorbonne, were there any in Chapel Hill? when you attended? I don't remember when I was an undergraduate there being a gay group. There were some church groups that were very sympathetic, and but at that time we were all pretty much unsure who we were. We knew we were different. We knew that we had to deal with the reality, but we didn't really know much about it. Mm -hmm. Do you think having those groups in France in your formative years helped you come out? I think they did very much. And, uh, and then later when I went to Stanford, that was a, a real eye-opener because California was ahead of the rest of the world, or at least ahead in the United States. And it gave me uh, much more courage than I would normally have had. Mm -hmm. So, when did you, once you graduated with your PhD, where did you start teaching? Well, my first teaching job was at State University. And, uh, I was teaching physical anthropology, which is not my specialty. Um, so, 
I was at a meeting of the American Anthropological Society and this uh, woman contacted me and took me to dinner and talked me into taking a job at UNCG. So, mm -hmm. so essentially the first real job was probably at UNCG. UNCG. And what year was that? Do you remember? Around 1970. Uh, yeah, about 1970. Okay. And I um, think I was in a unique situation by that time because even though people were, professors were fairly closeted and were a little bit nervous about my more being more open, mm -hmm. the fact is uh, the anthropology department had about four gay people Mm -hmm. two men and two women and again they varied in mm -hmm. terms of their willingness to be open right but uh, we outnumbered actually the straights so <laughs> there was no way they were going to do too much to us <laughs> so. given UNCG's faculty as a whole whatever you are aware of them how many LGBT members do you think we're on UNCG's faculty at the time? Could you give an estimate? <clears throat> it's really hard to say. And again, it was very, very closety. I remember when I was promoted to full professor, I got a wonderful note from a head of one of the schools, and she uh, had always just seemed like this hero, but nobody I thought was gay. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, I've met her Pearl and and right. various places. So, you know, I realized that she just couldn't come out, but she wanted to let me know that she was proud of me. And, and that. So we did try to give some support to each other. Some, some of us did. You know. mm -hmm. And external from UNCG's environment, did you find Greensboro to have a fairly healthy LGBT community? Well, no, that's why we uh, got the idea of starting GAU, Gay Academic Union. It was the first professional group, and our object was to gather the resources and see who was where in terms of gay leadership mm -hmm. so that we didn't anticipate the AIDS crisis at that time. But as it turned out, that and the class I taught actually train people so that they could deal with these crises mm -hmm. as they arise. Could you talk a little bit more about the Gay Academic Union? Well, we were, a friend of mine in the department, Bill Coleman and myself, were coming back from Eden, North Carolina, where we were looking at some rugs, and all of a sudden both of us just came to this idea that it was time that we formed some kind of group that would really educate. Because at that time, there was no, nothing on campus that would do that. And so we decided we would just form the Gay Academic Union. And we met in private homes until it got too big. And then finally, the United Church of Christ allowed us to meet in their facility. And it was a a wonderful, wonderful thing. We we decided from the very beginning that it had to be male, female. It couldn't be all men. And we invited various people that we had, and they weren't all gay. We would invite people to come and talk about the law and what we should know about, mm -hmm. and about health and about all kinds of issues personal and, and more professional. And it, I don't know that everyone was a professional who came to that group, but there were teachers, lawyers, doctors, nurses. Many were very closety and afraid. Mm -hmm. But I think as it grew, and it really grew, I don't know why it ever came to an end, but it, it did eventually uh, give way. Because the idea was to get something started and then when you had done that, then you would support other groups that would come in as wake. So. Mm -hmm. About how many members at a given time? I think we must have had about 60 people. 
and they would change you know, mm -hmm. every I think we met once a month and uh, we, we always served dessert because it was easy or you know, coffee and dessert and I know someone said we you must want to fatten us all up because <laughs> all you serve is dessert <laughs> So about what year was the uh, Gay Academic Union formed? That was pretty much after we arrived, so it would probably be in the mid-70s. Okay. You know. And you were out when you arrived I, at UNCG? Yeah, I was. Okay. Would you say you were the first out faculty member at UNCG? I don't know. There might have been a couple of others who were... Of course, that word out, you're out in a certain way but not necessarily in every way. But I, uh, I got to the point where it didn't matter what course I taught. I had some little messages to get across right. that dealt with this subject because I thought it was so important in anthropology. Right. Can you tell us how you incorporated LGBT issues into your curriculum? Well, I remember once I, I would choose films that would give at least some discussion of this issue. And I remember one of my colleagues standing outside the door listening to this this film that was going on. And he asked me later, he says, well, how do you get by with doing that? And I said, well, it's not a matter of getting by with. The anthropology is about human beings. As far as I know, we're human beings. So. So it, was, it was just part of it. How did the students receive that information? I think the students were were very good. I I was nervous, and I remember once lecturing at uh, Duke University, and I got all nervous and everything. But the students were just great. They really seemed to be what they really wanted was some honesty about sexuality in general. And uh, we, even when I taught the gay course, there was a course on sexuality, but the woman teaching it just didn't feel comfortable about including this in, in it because it would reveal too much about herself. And I understood that. But once uh, she got comfortable with herself through GAU and these other groups that were formed, then there was no longer need for me to teach the course forever. I mean, mm -hmm. it, uh, it had done what it meant to do. So. Right, and your course was the first course. It was the first approved course in the state of North Carolina. So it was well before Chapel Hill, Duke, any of these other schools. And so it really gave UNCG a place on the map for gay issues. And when I taught the course, we had people all over the state, and it was who would come and take the course, and it, it was really a heady experience. It was not all free of anxiety. You would have the religious tracts in your mailbox, and when we advertised anything, they would be ripped off the bulletin board. Uh, by that time, I had become a the youngest full professor at UNCG because I published so much and uh, so I, I didn't think I, they could fire me and, and they didn't, uh, didn't manage to do that but I think they would have liked to have fired me several times. So. Could you talk a bit about that? Well, the dean at that time, Miller, was, went on record as saying to the minister who was very open and accepting. But he uh, said, well, you know, they're all sick. These, these gays are all just, it's a sickness. And uh, you know, there's not much you can do about that. It's an attitude that's deeply ingrained. And uh, I, I was just surprised because he was Jewish and most of my Jewish friends are way ahead in the thinking process, so I, I just wondered why in the world he could come up with such notion, but he did. And uh, so they put barriers in my way. The biggest one was 
keeping my salary as low as I could possibly keep it. But uh, I've learned in life to accept the old adage that uh, the best revenge is living well. And I think I live very well, so <laughs> I don't worry too much about it. And there was pushback in your effort to receive tenure, right? There was pushback in your effort to receive tenure? Oh, there was. I, uh, I got the recommendation from the department, as you know, and then it goes to the dean's office and then to a bigger committee. And when it went to the dean's office, he blocked it. So it looked like I was not going to be promoted. But um, then when it went to the vice chancellor, he, um, he had a different feeling about that and he did not oppose it. And then it went to the larger committee and there were probably prominent gay faculty members on that committee. I, I didn't know them all, but uh, they v voted to overturn the dean's decision and I was promoted. So, and I was told I was the youngest person. They originally kind of used that against me. They said, well, you know, you're so young, you can, uh, you know, you'll be promoted later on, well, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Do you know of any other gay faculty members who were denied tenure? Yes, I, uh, several were fired because uh, of some angle on the gay issue. And the thing that really annoyed me was they never said, we're not going to promote you or we're going to fire you because you're gay. They just said, well, your uh, research is not strong enough. You know, that's an iffy sort of thing. UNCG at that time was not that much research oriented. And uh, so they used that. But my research was splendid. So <laughs> there was nothing they could do about that. And uh, even at one point when they tried to oppose me on the course being taught, I went to the vice chancellor and uh, I said, you know, if I keep getting this resistance of you, I'm going to uh, go to Canada. And that's not a threat, I just am, and take a job there. Because I did field work in Western Canada once, and I figured I could get a job there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you had to constantly stand up to them. And one person who was let go or not tenured was actually my lover at the time. and. He uh, was a very proud Italian, and uh, so he just wanted to just skip town. Right. But it broke up our relationship, and it made me very, very angry. And that's actually the time when I actually started becoming more activist. Uh, I don't think by temperament I am really much of an activist, but. When I'm mad about something, I will really fight back. So mm -hmm. I thought, I just had this. I'm not going to put up with this. So. Um, since you were more or less the most visibly gay person on our campus in the 70s, mm -hmm. I would say probably the first really visibly gay faculty member, uh, did you have many students coming out to you? I think I did, uh, and certainly when I started teaching the gay course. Not everybody who came to the gay course was, in fact, uh, uh, gay. And there's many funny stories about that. But anyway, the um, woman who started the first student group, and I'm sorry I can't remember her name, she was a charming young woman, she said she was straight, and she may have been, and may still be, but, uh, and that's fine. So I, I believe the first organizer of the gay student group on campus was probably a self-identified straight woman. Hmm. And I remember, the only thing I most remember was her mother. Her mother uh, sought me out and wanted to interview me and ask me some questions about it. And so I invited her to my home on Kensington and we sat out on the porch and 
she was very nervous and worried about her daughter. And I told her, I said, you know, your daughter wants to be a lawyer and she's thinking about people who need help and you should be very proud of her. And uh, I think it'd be wonderful training for her. But that seemed to help ease her mind a bit. She didn't give me any personal trouble about that because I, I didn't ever try to uh, pro, to probe into people's sexuality. I, I figured many people came because they didn't know quite who they were. Right. And uh, so if someone said, I'm straight, well, I took that face value and uh, didn't make any difference to me one way or the other. At that time, we didn't know much about uh, transgendered people, but I did have one woman in my class who uh, came to me after class, and she was a very beautiful young woman, and I really didn't think she was, I didn't know anything about it much, and she said she was uh, going through the operation at Duke University. You know, Duke at that time was doing these operations and uh, later when I did research in Finland on gay self-help groups and suicide prevention, I met a woman who was transgendered and uh, she uh, had her operation at Duke University. So this woman said, well, I knew you would understand. And I said, well, you know, I would like to understand more about it and you can teach me, but I actually, as a gay man, I, I don't, really know that I do understand much about it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I really tried to uh, recognize the fact that there were, there were many sexualities and uh, there were many homosexualities. And that, that was a big surprise. I, I think probably the big surprise was learning that gays are qu quite like straight, you know, that, their class differences, their religious differences, their, we don't all fit into one category. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. have several straight friends now that you met as, as your students. That's in, right. That I, class. Especially slightly older students who came back, and uh, mostly women, but they uh, have been friends for 25 or 30 years or more. Wow. Yeah. Do you keep in touch with some of your old students, like many of your old students? I haven't kept in touch with the students as much, and I uh, am sorry that after that class finally disbanded, that we didn't keep a roster. But again, it was part of that causative feeling that people weren't happy about having their name on a list. Mm -hmm. If we had had email in those days, they wouldn't have wanted to be on an email list. But it would have been like coming out. That's right. Yeah. And I remember one guy, very handsome young man, he wanted to get into the Marines, and he uh, had noticed that, uh, you know, on his curriculum vita that it listed that he had taken this gay course and he was worried about it, thinking, do you suppose this will keep me out of the Marines? But by that time, I don't think it would have. And I, I, I never did learn whether it did or didn't, mm -hmm. but I tried to assure him that that was, that he didn't have to be gay to take a course on homosexuality. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the, uh, students in the class was in fact the chancellor's son and he was not gay at all but uh, he had heard about it and he just kind of wanted to come along and, you know see what he could learn so what did the other faculty members think of the popularity of this course i got mixed feelings from gay people on campus some were very frightened that i was going to including my boss, who was a lesbian, that I was going to just go too far and, and make matters worse for them. And others secretly let me know that they, uh, they were approving. One example was one of the women in my class was very 
uh, very beautiful young woman and she wanted to have lunch with me one day and I didn't think she was gay. I thought she was just, you know, an open-minded person. Where it turned out she was the lover of a faculty member who was very closeted. I want to identify the department, but and I had not known that either one of them were gay, you know, it's just, but that was her way of saying to me, we're so happy you're doing this. Yeah. But I don't imagine the uh, university would have been very happy to have a gay faculty member, you know, taking up with a student. And, uh, So Bill was not my student. <laughs> <laughs> well, they would not be happy about the student, whether they're straight or gay. I expect that was true. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So uh, you published a few uh, few pieces on homosexuality, but your academic career was very much focused in New Zealand, your studies, your research. Right. Oh, all the things I... Uh, published uh, probably the gay issue was mostly in uh, articles mm -hmm. and, and a little bit later in my career although I started with a couple in Paris you know, that were written for gay journal but mostly I was interested in identity you know why people think they are who they are and how they arrive at who they are. Mm -hmm. And that figures very much into the gay issue or any minority, right. racial, sexual, whatever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it's an age old question. And uh, the first study among the Maoris was of the Maori University graduate, the first study of, of Maori tertiary education. And they were an identity group that was very special among Maoris because only a fraction of Maoris went through university. And so they had to work out a, a broker relationship between the traditional Maori culture and language and customs and then their having blended into a sort of Pakeha society. And I think uh, I learned a lot on the gay issue from that though, about identity theoretically, but also um, the fact that uh, I met a lot of Maoris who were gay, gay or lesbian, and uh, it was so interesting to me because I would guess with the opposition in the United States, most gays at that time and maybe now identify first as gay and then they might identify with a whole bunch of other things down the road but Maoris always identified first as being a Maori the gay thing was kind of secondary I mean they identified many of them as gay mm -hmm. and they were happy to be gay but they did not uh, it did not supersede being a Maori mm -hmm. that was. so what I began to realize that identity only lives and thrives in an atmosphere of opposition. So if there were no opposition, there would not be much need to identify that way, you know. So I know as I age, I now mostly identify as an older person because there are lots of challenges that come with age. So. Uh, I still identify strongly as a gay man, and uh, so it would be certainly secondary. Mm -hmm. So, when what when do you remember AIDS uh, first hitting the campus? People beginning to talk about it. The AIDS crisis. I don't know. It was it was such a difficult thing for me to come to grips with, and I uh, realized when it happened that we were more or less prepared for it because of GAU and the gay course, 
students forming their own group and so forth. So we were somewhat mobilized and ready for it. But on the personal level, it took me a personally a long time to really accept it. And then I began to have friends who were dying. And I don't remember anyone particular who was still at UNCG on the faculty, but my friend I told you who didn't get tenure and who moved to New York, he did eventually come down with AIDS and did die. Uh, so it began to really uh, come home to me that this was real. And uh, I couldn't continue the gay course as I understood its mission because I knew it would have to be an AIDS course and I wasn't prepared to, to do that. I, I didn't know enough about it and it frightened me to death. And, uh, especially as friends began to come down with But we were somewhat more isolated. At first we just thought that this only happens in New York and San Francisco. It, it, it's not going to hit Greensboro. But then it, it did. It, it, but I think what we had done as a preparation, not knowing that it would happen, was good. I mean, it, you had people who were more self-identified, who were willing to take up the battle, mm -hmm. and who were determined and so forth. And I don't think they would have been had they had not had that experience. So, so I feel good about what we were able to achieve, even though I personally couldn't do that. In fact, I was asked by the CDC to uh, take a job there because they knew that I could interview people well, but I, I couldn't bring myself to do that. But, uh, it would have been a total change in lifestyle. Right. So, and I think uh, that may be sad, but it's just, uh, I think you have to work from your strengths and not, not your fears and so forth. So. Were you aware of any of UNCG's response to the AIDS epidemic? I really wasn't, I, uh, except the students from my class who, uh, they would call me and try to get me more involved <laughs> and I would drag my feet about it, but it's, uh, uh, I didn't stop after the class being an activist and I would give lectures and, and then I went back to New Zealand and Australia, do some field work and, and I did whether I felt more comfortable doing it, I don't know, but I did talk a little bit about the early AIDS crisis in Australia, I remember lecturing about that, because they had, it hadn't really hit them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I remember a poignant story that I started off with in this lecture. There, there was a young man, not a student at UNCG, but a, a, just a working class lad, who uh, discovered he had uh, AIDS and he just walked in front of a train in Greensboro. And, uh, so it really hit me that this was going to have repercussions. And then I applied for a grant to do uh, gay self-help groups and suicide prevention. And I got very interested in uh, not so much the age crisis per se, but of how the struggle in being a lesbian or a gay man uh, was going to be in terms of suicide prevention. At that time, there were more gays and lesbians committing suicide uh, than the, the population would call for. And I remember in Sweden and Finland, the gay activists saying to me, well, I don't know that this is a good idea because you're perpetuating a stereotype that gays are suicide prone, but that was in fact true. And uh, I wasn't trying to perpetuate that idea, I just wanted to see how the self-help groups could help them avoid that. And the first day um, I arrived, in fact, 
there was a story about a, a lesbian woman who had called a church group to uh, get some help because she was about to sweat her wrist and they lectured her about she was going to hell and luckily she didn't kill herself she then remembered this sticker that was all around town about call this gay group and she called the gay group that I was working with and uh, they rushed over and saved her life but that really came home to me about uh, the implications and especially for uh, suicide and then I don't know if I told you the story but it was a good story uh, again they were somewhat closeted I'm sure even in Helsinki and in Sweden but they had an international psychiatry meeting and it was very expensive to, to go to so I didn't think I would probably do that but someone sent me a free ticket and that was their way of saying we want you to go and so I, I went and they had a lecture on family and I, some aspects of identity so I went to that and there was a Russian speaker and I challenged him about Code 20, which was a horrible law in Russia punishing gay people. And well, all hell broke out. And so uh, this woman stood up and she said, this is on family, it doesn't have anything to do with homosexuality. I said, well, gays have family as well. Then this lesbian jumped up and she took my side and it just, it was just chaos. And I got so annoyed that I walked out finally and there was a long flight of steps and I was just really unglued and I slipped and fell and there was this older man who was coming up the steps and he called me and he said, I think we need to talk. And he was a psychiatrist. And so we sat down and he said, tell me what's bothering you. And I said, well, and I told him about this incident and then my study, what I was doing, studying the relationship of self-help groups and how they might prevent suicide. He said, you know, I'm the editor of the International Journal of Suicide Prevention. <laughs> That's why I was sad that I'd lost his heart. And uh, he said, would you send me a copy of the study? And I said, well, I certainly will. And I did, and he published it. Wow. So it was one of those rare things that happen in academia where you think the world's falling apart, and yet there's always some good person out there willing to catch you as you fall on the mm -hmm. stairs. So... I really uh, love that, the way it happened. So the self-help group you were involved in here, that was different from the Gay Academic Union? It was a little bit like Academic Union, except it was organized in Sweden and Finland. The self-help groups were organized for, not professional groups per se, but just for anybody mm -hmm. who was struggling with their, their uh, issues of identity and sexuality. And they were very, uh, very good about that. They, they had some uh, opposition as well, but Scandinavia has always been ahead of the United States, and they also uh, recognized the first unions, which were like marriages. And I, when I published things, I would mention that. So, and when I lectured, I would always mention that there were several leagues ahead of us, mm -hmm. and uh, that was good. It gave gays hope. Right. Sometimes, I know when I used to write letters to the editor all the time, and one of my friends, a straight friend, said, because they you know, basically defeated us on the first rounds, and so he said, well, your letters didn't do any good, and I said, well, you know, I don't write letters 
to change everything. I write letters to gay people so that they feel better about themselves. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's, that's the way I always approached it. So if they don't understand, if everybody doesn't understand, at least we can help gays understand who they are. Mm -hmm. So that was very important to me. So, But then later, I reminded him, it did help. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a story unto itself. <laughs> so. so did you ever, uh, did people, after you wrote these letters to the editor, contact you and were they the first, were, were, were your letters the first, first public support they saw? Well, most of the letters are during that period where we were discussing gay marriage. Mm -hmm. And I think my perspective was good because there were lots of misinformation floating around. One being that, you know, gay people just thought this up yesterday and they're forcing it on us. When in fact, there has been gay marriage in anthropological literature, so it has a very old background. Right. And not everybody was opposed to it. So, uh, you know, I could point out the anthropological things with some, some hope that I was being objective and, and basing on science and research. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I, I tried to stick to what I knew, not just... It wasn't just an opinion article, it was, okay, when you say this, this, and this, can you back that up? Do you have any evidence for that? Right. So. Um, and relating to that and going back to UNCG, do you remember giving a presentation with the Reverend Joseph Flora in Strong Dormitory around 1979 Yes, or so? I do. And Joe was a wonderful person. And I had a friend from California visiting who was a rather tough looking guy. And all of a sudden there were people walking around in sheets and chanting something. I didn't pay much attention to right. what it was. I thought it was funny, to tell you the truth, but then we realized that this was could ricochet into something more. Their opposition was really not very pleasant. So this friend of mine <laughs> walked out, he was California, uh, and he kind of bullied them into leaving the scene. <laughs> but, you know, there were moments, certainly when we taught the course, when I taught this gay course, when I uh, was a little nervous about going out at 9 o'clock. It was a night course, mm -hmm. uh, and going back to my car, you know, you wonder whether you might be costed. But in those days, honestly, in all fairness, I don't think it's as, as bad as this radicalized Christianity where people don't think much about killing people nowadays. I don't think I felt like someone might kill me. They might beat me up, but they, they weren't trying to actually shoot you. Mm -hmm. But we've become so kind of lawless and there's so much acceptance of violence that I think the younger gays today have a different challenge. Yeah. Can you speak a bit about what you're aware of of the differences generationally between gay people of your time versus the younger gay people of today? Well we certainly had to deal with closeted gays <laughs> and more than today, I suspect most people think that they're open and out and they don't worry about it. But uh, <laughs> I uh, I applaud uh, the openness, but on the other hand, I think it's becoming legalistically it's becoming much more a challenge because. You probably heard about the recent Supreme Court decision. So if we continue the way we're going, anybody can turn people down for a job. They can say they don't want you in their church, or they don't want you in their schools, they don't want you here and there. Uh, I think we did not have that kind of issue to deal with. 
and I expect that um, it's going to be different. Yeah. I, I would guess it will be. Mm -hmm. So, were you involved with any of the self-help groups that were created in Greensboro um, for the LGBT population, especially right, like around in the 1990s or so? Uh, I guess by that time I was so busy, I probably was less involved, but uh, certainly my students were the ones who really challenged other groups like hospice and various uh, groups that deal with poverty and any number of self-help agencies to have representation on these groups. And I, I applauded that and I think that's a wonderful idea. And uh, I know we went to a dinner not too long ago through the Green Foundation. Right, Guilford Green. And they had invited a number of non-gay uh, representatives there too to make sure that they knew that <laughs> there were still gay people out there who might seek help through their agencies, not mm -hmm. just through a gay self-help group. So you've trained an army of That's students right. to go out. That's, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, um, Taking you a little bit back, when you first started at UNCG, were you aware of UNCG's reputation as being UNC gay? UNC gay? Mm -hmm. Oh, that was banted around uh, a lot. I think that was, it was also sometimes called UNC girls because it <laughs> used to be a woman's campus and it had more of the arts in it and would attract gay and non-gay people were interested in the arts. I was thought it was rather amusing, but uh, I don't know that people necessarily thought it was a more gay or less gay. Uh, by that time, I think most of these campuses had their own gay group. Mm -hmm. And I would lecture sometimes in these groups at Duke or, or further afield mm -hmm. in the North Carolina system. I don't think they had a gay group at State University <laughs> for a long time. They, right. they surely have one now. Would you say that Greens, uh, UNCG with its, of all the local universities like A&T and Bennett and right. uh, I guess Wake Forest, Elon, that we were probably the most friendly campus? Were we like the most gay friendly campus in this area? I think we really were. and. Uh, the joke about you know having more gays it was was not unkind. I mean, it was uh, it was just a recognition that there was more openness. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. Yeah. Right. So, how long were you with the Department of Anthropology? I think close to thirty-one years. Wow. Yeah. Were you the uh, longest reigning faculty member in that department? <laughs> I doubt it. Uh, Harriet Kupfer may have been the older. She was older than me. But uh, I, I, by that time, you know, uh, there were just small things that had to be done. It's like, the tradition had to change in the faculty way of doing this. It's like before I came on the scene, if they had a faculty picnic or a faculty party, uh, you didn't bring your lover or your partner. Mm -hmm. You didn't. I mean, they stayed home. Uh, you would go by yourself. Where straight people, of course, would bring their spouses. and. Uh, so that changed, you know. But you you had to just re-educate people. You just had to say, you know, I'm going to bring my partner with me. That's mm -hmm. okay. And they say, oh yeah, sure. It wasn't they were necessarily opposed to gay people. Right. They just never done it before. Mm -hmm. So, and once they did it, 
you know, it's like you've met Bill. Everybody likes Bill, so you know. Yeah. He's more like him than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, I want you to mention Pearl Berlin. Yes. He was one of your first friends. The when I walked on campus, my first two people I met was Pearl Berlin, who recently died, you know, and Gay Cheney. And then later they would invite me to serve on a committee with them or they'd have a graduate student who wanted to have a committee that included at least a couple of gay people mm -hmm. since they were gay. And um, so we did help each other that way by saying okay. And, and we were also helpful for each other professionally because I was never very good in the statistics but when I studied nutritional anthropology for 10 years I uh, wanted to make up this game where I could measure eating habits and, and so I went to Pearl and I'd say you know more about statistics give me uh, some guidelines about how I measure this mm -hmm. and she would and we share in these things so we had both a personal relationship but we also had a professional relationship and uh, and I always admired that especially about women they were very professional and I like that um, so in you know, terms of the faculty makeup what percentage would you say were like gay men versus lesbians I'm not very good with statistics, but I tell you that I think that because it had been a woman's campus, there were probably a fair number more women than mm -hmm. men. Um, that may be why more of my friends are probably women than <laughs> men. And, uh, but in those days, you didn't just mingle with your gay faculty, you would, uh, you know, you would have your friends outside of academia. Mm -hmm. and they might be academics, they might not be. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I, I think that uh, I may have helped them in the sense that they could be more open. Mm -hmm. But they helped me professionally in many ways, I'm sure. And, uh, and so we, we shared in a common intellectual bond. Mm -hmm. That's good. So. Would you say that the women were more or less open uh, out than, men, than the men? Not necessarily. Uh, I would guess over half of them were probably never out mm -hmm. until they retired or something. Or, you know, people were out among their private friends when they have a party or something. But, uh, no, I don't think they were and not outspoken, even though some of them were high up in the administration. Mm -hmm. One of them became a vice chancellor and has a building name for her. Wonderful. But, so, but... She and I were great friends, but she would never uh, have raised her voice. She was one of these really very polite Southern women. You know. So it didn't seem necessary for her to do that. Mm -hmm. so. Do you think there's a bit of a loss in these uh, these individuals who were not open, who did not feel they could be out, oh, the I fact that so. the history also doesn't reflect the major who they loss, were. I think, is a, it's an existential insult to self, so that you're allowing people to confine your own normal expressions of who you are. Um, it's like sometimes straight people would say, well, you don't have to talk about these things. Well, do they not talk about these things? You know, mm -hmm. do they not talk about their loved ones, their families, you know, this sort of thing. But the, the South has always been so hypocritical. It's like the South thinks that as long as you don't talk about something, it'll just kind of go away and disappear. 
So I, I think that, that was bad. But I think it also affected their ability to have long-term partners. Mm -hmm. So if you can't come out and you work, you're probably not going to move in with somebody and live openly with them. Mm -hmm. And I remember a straight man coming to a lecture I gave when one of my books came out and had a book signing. And it turned out he had a lesbian daughter, but he himself was straight and had been struggling to understand these things. And he said, you know, the thing I most admire about you, Tom, is that you just quietly went on about your life and decided you are going to be who you wanted to be, live your life you wanted to live it. Well, I don't know how quiet I was about it, but it, so on the other hand, you know, I decided, look, if I want to live with another man, I'm going to live with another man. Mm -hmm. You're not going to tell me I can't do that. So, right. And if you don't like it, that's fine, you know, but uh, that's not going to stop me from doing that. But I think we have to make some choices. It's like there are nursing homes that are anti-gay, there are religious groups that are anti-gay. You have to say, look, I'll find a group that I fit in and enjoy myself. And if they don't like it, well, then I won't have anything to do with them. But it's, uh, so that, that's sad that it's that way, but that's the reality for racial groups and all kinds of groups. So. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, personally see, you, you spoke of um, your lover who didn't get tenure, did you see other relationships of people on campus break up because they were not allowed to live together, they had to appear to be straight? Yes, I uh, don't know in every case whether it was just that. I mean, there are always, I mean, people break up for so many reasons, but I think that was an additional stress, there's mm -hmm. no doubt about it. And if you have a couple where one of them is very closety and very non-accepting of self and the other is not, I don't think it's going to work. Mm -hmm. you know, it's probably not going to work. So, mm -hmm. but I don't think from the time I came to UNCG I was ever in the closet. So. So, um, given the 30-year span you were on campus, what would you say is the biggest change that you saw over that time? Well, I don't think uh, I don't think one would be fired because you're gay or lesbian. And in fact, I think now there was effort to actually hire for diversity, not just gay and lesbian, but all sorts of groups. And uh, I think it's most prominent with the women's movement. And in this case, certainly the women's movement helped the gay and lesbian movement, but I think we also helped them too. And, uh, and I think they recognize that right away. And, uh, in fact, when I had this book signing, it was the women's group that actually uh, sponsored it, the lecture, and, and we had a reception and that sort of thing at home campus. So, so I, I, I see lots of areas that are non-gay that have opened up, and I think that's great. And, I've always been very proud of being in the university because we have always tried to uh, to be open to diversity. And so far, I think you've done pretty well. So. Mm -hmm. so this is going to be online for everyone to see. Is there anything you would like to say that we haven't talked about yet? Well, I told you I was very interested in aging, and although I don't know that all the needs of, of gays and lesbians and transgender people are being met uh, as, as they age, uh, I just want to leave on a happy note that, that I feel like that I'm very happy that in my old age and 
experience that I found a wonderful partner and that's just been about three years after my partner of 30 years died and so there's hope out there even as you get older and uh, you don't have to necessarily uh, give up living so that's a wonderful message <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much